Okay, so transaction processing. What do we cover? Number one, problems that happen with scale. Better. Uh, number two, transaction process and principles. Uh, I don't know, why is that? That light troubles. There we go. Uh, and possibly we'll get to two-phase commit today. I don't think so, but we'll see. And then eventually we'll cover network architecture in regard to transaction processing systems and uh, then object description languages. So this is actually some old data. I think it's like a couple years ago. Uh, Amazon is big, really big, 122 billion in revenues. We can actually look up a more current number. Let's see what they're up to these days. Amazon 2018 revenue. Holy shit, 232 billion. So they're out of control. That's where all the money's going. Okay, it's vastly bigger than, I mean, I know they're growing, but wow, damn. Okay. So, roughly speaking, if that's about, you know, 122 billion, they're probably something around 15% global share of retail sales, right? Bearing in mind that the whole pie has increased too. Uh, and 6.4% global share of e-commerce, that's probably about 10% now. So one company worldwide is that big. That's crazy. All right. Now, this scale of operation, of course, generates a lot, you know, requires a lot of network traffic. So they have a very big network, very high capacity, messages going back and forth all day long. Amazon, just by itself, has to process uh, several hundred transactions per second on average. On top of that, right, it's not just the transaction itself, but it's all the extra browsing activity. So every time somebody goes to a page, that page has to do a bunch of database calls to pull images, pull current price data, pull how many are left in stock, all those kind of things, okay? But Amazon's cloud network, which we'll talk about in a week or two, is actually so big, it can handle up over a million transactions per second. Now. Amazon, right, they're only managing its own stuff. Remember when we talked about isolation and the idea that you don't want these uh, database transactions to interleave? Amazon really only has to worry about Amazon as far as that interleaving. So if it has a whole bunch of uh, different clients, those clients generally are not going to have to worry about different people accessing the same data, right? Every client that sets up an operation in Amazon's cloud or is operating more or less separately from all the others. So this million transactions per second, yeah, it's a high capacity problem, but it's made easier because a lot of this stuff can operate totally in parallel. That, you know, for example, if Nike and New Balance and whoever else is selling shoes through Amazon, they don't have to worry that people are looking at the same data at the same time. They can just keep their own stuff isolated. So none of the individual customers are probably doing more than Amazon is. Okay. What is a transaction? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One is the ordinary consumer view. So if you know you walked in here the first day and I asked you what a transaction is, you'd probably say somebody buying something, right? Yeah, that's part of it. So that's what people think of ordinarily when we talk about transactions. It's some exchange involving a payment. And it could be I give you money, you give me stuff, or it could be where you're clearing an ob obligation. For example, you go to on some your online bank account and you pay your credit card bill, right? You're not actually getting anything, you're clearing, the, you're clearing the debt. But computer science view or database view has a little bit, uh, little bit different definition. So in that sense, a transaction is any communication that involves some sort of mutual recognition of a change to a couple of databases. So for example, uh, creating a new customer account. I go to some website, I say, I wanna create an account you know, after I'm done, their database has a record that my account is created and I have an understanding, you know, even if I don't formally keep it in a database, I have an understanding that my account has been created too and I can go back and access it. It's a transaction, it's a change that's happened to the database. Anytime you update database contents, right? For example, you go to an ATM, you take out some money, the bank account, you know, on the bank side, they show that the money's gone and me, I have the money in my wallet. So. Again, that, that data in a sense has changed. Or even querying a database and receiving a response. That can be a kind of transaction. You know, something changes, uh, I ask the database something, it gives me the results, and then what I have should match what the database has. So any of those kind of things, basically database operations 
A lot of those are considered transactions. Okay. So anytime we talk about transaction rates, remember those are averaged over the day. And roughly speaking, probably doubled during regular shopping hours, right? So say from, uh, I don't know, 10 in the morning to 10 at night is probably Amazon's busy time. You know, 4 a.m., there aren't a whole lot of people shopping on there. So it means if they say Amazon, on average, several hundred transactions per second, it's actually about twice that because it's only like 12, a 12-hour 12 window where most of the activity is happening. And, of course, multiply during major shopping events. So the big one for Amazon is, yeah, Prime Day. You Black Friday. Black Friday is big, but Prime Day. Prime Day was an event so big this last time around that even Amazon's system had trouble meeting demand. There was like, you know, pages uh, weren't loading correctly uh, because there was so much traffic. But yeah, Black Friday is a big one, sure. Uh, don't they have, they have, don't they call it like Cyber Monday though? That's the different, that's the Amazon, right? Because, yeah. Anyway, and still growing. As we saw, right, just looking at these numbers for Amazon, really, the growth has been phenomenal, right? More than doubling in three years from what in 2015 was already the world's biggest retailer. What's that? Did some, was there a holy shit back there? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, any transaction that happens, there's a bunch of other stuff going on, right? So the first thing when we think of the transaction is just all the data that we think would be necessary. So the items you're buying, the person's credit card number, stuff like that. All that, you know, the basic things that are absolutely necessary to uh, process the transaction. But there's also lots of supporting information, right? Because on Amazon, you don't just, you know, have like some blank page where you type in stuff like you do on Google. You actually go to a page where there's a whole lot of content, right? Images of the item, uh, user reviews, all that kind of stuff. People who bought this, bought that. So all that supporting information in the web page, that gets brought up too. And on top of that, lots of browsing around uh, purchases, right? So people, most people do not just go to Amazon and know exactly what they want and buy that one thing and don't look at anything else, right? There's a lot of people who browse around the site, you know, they say, oh, let's see what they got. And they do some searches and they do some comparisons. So yeah, most viewed items are not actually purchased, right? For everything that's viewed, people are probably looking at least 10 or 20 web pages. You know, a lot of times people go to Amazon, check something out, and then they don't even buy it that day. So the bulk of the traffic is not from this, not from the transaction, but from all this other stuff. And there's also lots and lots and lots of secondary transactions. So what are secondary transactions? Well, let's bring up paint. So this is you. We'll draw you in red because you're in debt to Amazon. Okay, so that's you. And Amazon down here is in orange, because that's apparently their color now. Anybody have an Amazon credit card? I do, yeah, it's orange, right? Uh, no, I have a Prime Visa. Ooh, la, wow. Well, I have a Prime Visa. Well, I think I have a Prime. This is so fancy. All right, well, damn it, I had a card. Which one of you took it? There it is. Mine is, ah, it's a Visa, but perhaps not a Prime Visa. My wife has the, uh, the Prime account. I don't, so that's probably it. Mine is orange, so I draw Amazon in orange. All right. Cool. Good to know. All right. So I go to Amazon. I buy some stuff, right? What am I buying? I am buying some socks, okay? I go to Amazon and buy a... 12 pack of socks. All right. Now, what happens when that uh, goes on? There's a few things. Number one, Amazon's going to check with the credit card company. Who is the credit card? Well, let's say it's Visa. I don't know. Okay. So when I try to buy the stuff, right, I click buy it, and Amazon sends a transaction to Visa, and Visa will basically give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, right, for whatever's going on. So that's a secondary transaction. That's something that's got to happen. What else? Well, behind the scenes at Amazon, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's got to go on. For example, shipping. 
right? So things like delivery date and tracking number. I want to get that. That's a secondary transaction. Amazon has to call another database, get that uh, information. What else? Inventory management. One less 12 pack of socks in stock might need to reorder, okay? So Amazon's managing that. If, you know, socks are a popular thing, Amazon says, oh, we're running low on socks, we gotta get some more. There's a system that handles that. Uh, all of its internal analytics, right? So things like product rank in category. Right? Anytime you go to Amazon, you'll see this product ranks such and such out of so many in this category. They have to update that right? eventually. They're probably not going to do that in real time, but they will eventually update it. Okay, so anytime you buy something on Amazon, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's all kinds of other shit going on too. Amazon's doing a lot of secondary transaction as well. And all of these, it wants them to be up to date. So that is a big problem. So we understand secondary transactions? Yeah, okay. All right, so to be competitive, to actually survive as a large retailer and be able to you know, process transactions quickly enough, because there's nothing worse than you, know, you click on that buy now button and the button just spins for like 10 or 20 seconds. You're like, oh shit, did stuff go through? Do I need to cancel it? Should I click it again? What's gonna happen, right? You want it to click and go through and be pretty much instantly delivering you to a confirmation page. So in order to do that, to be competitive, right? Because that's, that's a key thing. If every time you try to buy something at this scale, the wheels spin for like 30 seconds, people are gonna get nervous and go somewhere else. Large retailers have to have very reliable, high capacity, high capacity cloud services. In the case of Amazon, they deploy their own. In the case of most retailers, they run it somewhere else, right? So most retailers are not in the cloud game. Amazon happens to be. Okay. So a little bit of a history lesson. So back in 1994, the internet existed. But it was pre-World Wide Web, so browsers weren't that exciting. You basically got, you know, basically raw text when you were looking at stuff. And it was pretty much a specialized tool for things like government, military, research, education. If you weren't in a research program or, you know, some higher up person in the government or a college student, you probably, you might have heard of the Internet, but it wasn't something you actually used in 1994. So... Amazon started in 1994, right, uh, as an online bookseller. And the big thing, right, there's a lot of inventory challenges involved with physical stores. So let's talk. Let's talk. We'll have a little, we'll have a little discussion. So anybody here alive in 1994? Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, you too. All right. So yeah, so a couple of you were alive. That's kind of fun. All right, what's that? All right, okay. So we go in the Wayback Machine. We are now in 1994. And for all practical purposes, there is no internet, but there will be soon, okay? Let me tell you, if Amazon had started in, say, 1993 as trying to be an internet company, it might have been too early and missed the boat. If they tried to start in 1996, might have been too late and missed the boat. So for sure, some company would have come along and basically done the stuff that Amazon did. Some company is going to get big at retail, right? It happened to be, you know, through leadership and right place, right time, all that, Amazon ended up being the one. But it would have been somebody. Okay, 1994, what are the pros and cons of setting up an online uh, site to compete with what were called brick and mortar, still called that I guess, brick and mortar booksellers, okay? That's who you're going against. 
online book selling isn't really a thing in 1994. If you wanted to buy a book in 1994, God help you, you had to get on some pants and get out of your house and walk to an actual bookstore and interact with a human, and it was horrible. We were all waiting for the internet to take us away from that. Okay, so what do you do? What are the pros and cons? Pros. Anything good about online book selling? Like as, as a business point, yeah. Um, so I mean, in an brick and mortar store, there's only a limited selection of books, but if it's online, you can go, there's way more variety than that. Okay, and I would counter, here's the counterpoint. I'm not saying you're wrong. Okay. Counterpoint, you go, has anybody ever been to a physical bookstore? Why are you all lying to me? I know you haven't. No, they would still be in business if you'd all gone. Anyway, that's fine. That's just fine. Anyway, you go to a bookstore and you say, oh, I was looking for such and such. Do you have such and such? And they check their catalog and they say, no, we don't have it, but we can order it for you. And what do you say? I can do that myself. Okay, but it's 1994. Right, so here's the thing. So pros, unlimited, uh, what's the word of the way, product line, okay? If it exists, you can get it, right? But stores will offer, right? But the difference is this. If you've already gone out to the bookstore once, a lot of people have a resistance to like, oh, you know what, I already came out once, I don't wanna come back again. You know, that, that's really, it's more of a psychological thing, right? Stores will offer, but a lot of people don't take them up on it. You're kind of like, well, I kind of want it right now. But I'm going to have to wait a few days. Yeah, I might as well get it sent to home. Okay. What's another pro for online bookstores? Online. What's an advantage? If you are a business operator, why would this potentially be more attractive? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right? Unlimited reach. If they have a computer, they can go to your site, right? This is the big one. Yeah, now, competition is tougher too, right? But, but competition, very tough. Why? Because every other site that's going to be existing, they have that same thing. So you got to be really good at what you do. Okay. But yeah, somebody's going to win that game. What else? Anything else? Cheaper. Is it? In what sense? Okay. All right. Let's go with that. So that's good. Uh, number one buying in bulk, right? They can do that for sure, right? Because again, unlimited reach. Once they get big, okay? The other thing, limited expenses for facility operation, right? Bookstore, brick and mortar store has to look pretty. Amazon can look like a warehouse, which it basically is. Okay? Yeah. No. No. It was it was nineteen it was primitive in nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Well the expectation in nineteen ninety four, right? We didn't have one day delivery really. I mean, you could, but you, nobody's going to pay like 25 bucks to FedEx a single book, right? There was an expectation if you bought something online in 1994, there would be shipping costs, and there would be a few days it took to get to you. That was just how it was, okay? Other pro, one last thing. One last thing. What do physical stores have to worry about that online stores basically don't? Stealing, excellent, right? Those thieving motherfuckers. So, people go into the stores, right? And they wear their long overcoats and they're all Slyberry Smith walking through the aisles and they wait to some way and then they go out, right? And that can be a substantial thing. If you're already a bookstore that's running on a thin margin and people are stealing like a few percent of your inventory, that can be deadly. So, 
very low incidence incidence of theft. Now, of course, yeah, you could have some warehouse guy try to pocket some books, but it's a lot easier to monitor a warehouse, right? They're employees, they're working for you. You can basically be intrusive and set up cameras everywhere. In a physical store, it's a lot trickier. You don't want to be intrusive to your customers. You don't want your customers going into the bookstore to feel like they're going into a maximum security prison. So, okay. So those are the pros. Cons, what are some cons? Yeah. People were scared. Scared? Why were people scared? They were. Why? Yeah. Right. People were scared. And, you know, the other thing, scared to buy online and from a brand new online business. Right. So it's a little bit of both. This was the thing, you know, people's grandparents uh, in the 90s, they were like, oh, man, you're buying stuff online. That's crazy. You're just giving away your credit card number. And I'm like, you've been buying from catalogs for decades. And you get on the phone and you call up some person you don't know. And you literally give them their no your credit card number over the phone. It's not that different, Grandma. Okay, but people had the perception that it was. And what it was is like if you're buying from Sears in 1994, Sears has like a hundred year history. You know, they're not some fly by night operation that's just going to run with your money, right? Whereas you go to some goofy operation that's you know its name is the Devil's Toenail or something because they had all had like crazy names in the 90s. And you're like, oh, that seems kind of sketchy. They might, they might just be like running with my money. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Um, I'm like a brick and mortar store. You can't, you can't you can just walk in and make sure that the book you want is the book you're getting, or even just walk in the book and say, you know what? I want to buy a book. I don't know what kind of book I want to buy. I just not want to buy a book. Just want to yeah. Amazon prevents you from doing that. You kind of have to know what you want to buy. Yeah. No ability to preview. Uh, I would argue that it's actually easier to search a website if they have some kind of search feature than to actually physically walk through the stores. But the searching is a new thing, right? No ability to preview, that's a real, uh, real thing. Less of a problem with books, because you know, it's a book. It's not like an article of clothing that you're gonna say, oh, how does this fit on me? How does it look, right? A book is just a book. But still, people like to preview what they're getting, make sure they're getting the right thing. Uh, and what was the other? Uh, sorry, I distracted myself. Okay, let's add in uh, shipping delay. Right, that's a con. Right, if it exists in the book, then you can in the bookstore you can get it right away. But shipping uh, shipping delays. What's that? Well, I mean, they have a return policy. It's a bit of a hassle, but you know you can do it. And most most of the time, you're not going to really return a book. But yeah, right. Uh, let's say customer service is probably better for a physical store. Yeah. Uh, in 1994, not so much. Yeah. I mean, it's really just selling physical books through a website. All right. So anyway, I think this is good enough. We don't need to, you know, really run this into the ground. But we see in 1994, there were some pros, there were some cons. But the trend, if we think about it, If internet shopping gets widespread, most of the cons go away, right? Basically through technology. So people won't be scared to buy online. People are used to it. Businesses have a history, right? They've been around, Amazon's been around for 25 years now. It has a history. They have preview features that are provided on the pages. Shipping delays, well, yeah, I mean, you still gotta get it shipped. But you save so much, people are usually willing to do that. Plus, right, nobody wants to go out and buy stuff, so you're saving there. So the real trade-off, you know, in most cases, if a physical store has the product and you need it right away, you go to a physical store. Or if you're just browsing around, if you're doing like shopping as recreation, you might go to a physical store. But if you want the stuff, but you can plan a little bit ahead, Amazon's going to save you a lot of money. Okay, so that's where we are now. Okay. Now, as Amazon grew, 
it needed lots of new systems. So initially, it was basically just uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, you know a, a copy of Excel and a dorm room full of books, and eventually a garage full of books. Right? There wasn't it wasn't a high tech operation off the start, but it started to take off. It started to get big. And as we've seen, these kind of big data problems, right? Excel back in the day, you could have a pretty limited uh, list of people, right? So Excel 97, the cap was 64K. Once your client list gets beyond that, you need to start expanding it to worksheets. Once you, uh, new worksheets, once you get really big, you know, you're not even going to keep it in one file anymore. You need separate systems. And of course, website traffic, right? Your website gets popular. You always want it to be available. You have to manage that. Transaction processing, you have a whole lot of transactions going on. Your transaction system needs to operate faster. Inventory management needs to be good. Uh, can't slow down transactions. Your delivery, your order fulfillment, that has to scale up. So all these kind of things, right? Stuff that's simple if it's one guy and a couple of his buddies working out of his garage, to become the biggest retailer in the world, all that kind of half-assed stuff isn't going to cut it anymore. Okay. So, early on, Amazon focused on retail, but eventually it branched into digital stuff, right? So, one of the first, so it started off with things like books and CDs and DVDs, things that were commodity goods, right? You don't really care who you buy it from. It's the same thing regardless. That kind of thing is easy to do online. But when you start selling digital things, yeah, you need a new system to do that, right? So having an array of music downloads, you got to be able to search the stuff. You got to have that's more network traffic. Uh, Kindle, Amazon Video that they have now, right? Streaming video is as uh, data intensive as things get. So all these digital products, they have to branch out. Now, there is a popular misconception. We'll talk about uh, cloud soups. We'll get there. So. Eventually, what happened, as Amazon got bigger, one of the things they started doing was letting third parties sell through Amazon. So they'd say, oh, you want to sell your stuff on our site, as opposed to Amazon actually owning the stuff and selling it to people. People would show up and say, oh, I want to basically, you know, set up a little storefront on Amazon. So Amazon got big. It was designing its own custom hardware and network systems because they could, you know, find other operations to build this stuff for them. And one of the things for scalability, it started allowing vendors to come in and sell stuff through Amazon. Well, when it does that, the natural thing to do is instead of designing a custom interface for allow every different vendor a unique way to set up their storefront, when you do that, it's a really big headache because everybody, you know, they have, to, they have their own way of describing their products. What Amazon did is it set up standard interfaces that if you are going to sell something on Amazon, your page is going to look like this and you're going to have a product listing and you're going to have some text and you're going to have space for so many images and it's going to all be done in a standard way. Once they do that, then they have the foundation of cloud service in. In fact, there is a, uh, there is a misconception that Amazon began renting out its excess capacity as a cloud service because people think, oh, they're a retail operation, they're busy 12 hours, hours out of the day, they're doing nothing the other 12 hours, but they still have all that network gear they could start renting that out to other companies. It's actually not what happened because even though they're doing the busy, busy with transactions during the day, there's a lot of stuff with database update and turning off machines for maintenance, stuff like that that happens in the off hours. So they're pretty much basically had just enough money to keep up with their demand. That wasn't really uh, what happened. It wasn't that Amazon bought a whole lot of hardware. It was only using it half the day, rented out the capacity. A lot of people think that, but not true. If you're interested, you check out the article. Okay. So, Amazon revenues, rough idea of what they're doing. And this is from a few years ago. I should update these, but, you know, the, the big numbers, they haven't changed wildly. Uh, merchandise, electronics, that sort of stuff, about 81%. Uh, media, about 17%. So, they're still mostly a retailer. Uh, where's their revenue coming from? Bulk of it from the U.S., most of the rest is coming from uh, Europe, right? There's J Japan's like 8%, and the rest of the world is about 8%, so, and the rest of the world includes a fair amount of Europe. Uh, product groups, you know, a lot of it is, again, retail. There's some third-party services. Amazon Web Services is a substantial slice. That's their cloud. Yeah, they're still selling a lot of stuff, though, right? So, basically a retailer. Uh, media is a growing slice, but still, you know, they're doing a lot of retail sales. That's still where they are.
Okay, so right now, Amazon is basically a hybrid retail and cloud services operation. So they get most of their revenues from retail, but most of their network traffic gets generated by their cloud services. So it's an interesting thing. Part of what's going on, part of how Amazon fell into cloud is that all the big companies that people thought, oh, these are the obvious ones that are gonna totally dominate cloud, like Google, like IBM, like Microsoft, things you might have guessed like 20 years ago, they're in cloud and they're big players. But the reason why Amazon is bigger is all those other operations, they already had good income stream, right? Google is making bags and bags of money off of ads. And Microsoft, well, back in the day, uh, Windows was their cash cow. And so they did it. They're into other stuff now. But uh, yeah, they're making, they were making money off that. IBM, they had their own uh, different things they were doing, like analytics services and selling mainframes and stuff. So for them, yeah, they could make money off cloud, but it wasn't as, you know, a completely obvious thing that this is what they want to chase. Amazon, on the other hand, in position of being a retailer, well, retailers generally have fairly low profit margins. So what Amazon says, yeah, you know, we make money doing retailing, but for us, cloud really looks like a great opportunity. We can actually make a lot more, uh, prop we can be more profitable by following cloud than these other companies. So for them, yeah, it worked out uh, that it seemed, you know, a good shift for them. Okay, so Amazon right now, right, it is, well, okay. We'll discuss Amazon's transaction processing system, but just keep in mind for now, it's only a fraction of what all they're doing. We'll get to the cloud in the in a week or two. So Amazon keeps its competitive advantage by innovating and by building on its existing operations. So talk about some of this stuff. Number one, once Amazon got big into books, right, they became the, the book leader, it was a pretty easy shift to say, okay, now we're actually going to sell other commodity goods like CDs, like DVDs. What works for one, right, all of their processes. Uh, so they used to essentially, they would call it when an order came in, they would contact the bookseller, contact the publisher and say, yeah, we need such and such copies of the book. And the bookseller would like round them all up and send them to Amazon and Amazon would unpack it and send the books to where they needed to go. It's not really different at all for dealing with CDs or DVDs. You go to the CD uh, manufacturer or you go to the DVD manufacturer, or whatever, or VHS tapes, because they had those in the 90s, right? Whatever it is you're selling, it's the same kind of process. So once their process got really good for handling books, it was easy for them to branch out that same process into other similar categories of products. <laughs> also, the system technology required to manage at scale Right? As Amazon got really big, instead of uh, basically setting up what are called tightly coupled systems, Amazon set up very modular systems using standard interfaces. The idea is anytime one system is communicating with another, it doesn't know, need to know the details of how that system is structured. Right? So for example, uh, if you are a vendor and you're trying to sell stuff through Amazon, you don't need to know all the details of how Amazon is going to set up your content. What you need to know is the format of what you send to Amazon. You send it a product name, a product title, a price, you know, how many you have on, on hand, uh, a few images. Amazon takes all that standard uh, input and uses it to construct the web page. You don't actually have to construct the web page itself. You send a batch of standard inputs and Amazon converts that into some standard outputs as a web page. That's the base of cloud. If you can do that sort of thing with one kind of data, and you set up a standard format for it, you can do that with about any kind of data, right? So you say, oh, instead of being a web page, you say, here's an application that's going to run. So I'm gonna pick a few machines that this application is gonna run on, and I'm gonna have a process for making copies of it when you know new users come on to use that application. All that sort of thing, standard interfaces, that's the base of cloud. Now, a little uh, bit about what's next, maybe. Let's take a peek, although this is, uh, again, from a couple years old, so it might be what just happened. Uh, what's next? Artificial intelligence. Anybody have an Alexa? Yeah, they're fun, aren't they? Yeah, you have a Google one? Those are probably fun, too. Yeah. Okay, so they got that. Uh, what they're looking at, things like Amazon wants to be a cloud-based voice software powering everything from car dashboards to consumer wearables, right? So this Internet of Things stuff. Eventually, we're gonna have the self-driving cars. They're probably gonna be voice activated, so that'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, they got stuff that they're working on. Anyway, what year is this, though? This is 2017, so yeah, a couple years old. Yeah? Did you hear about the bidding for the Army's, like, network cloud 
Oh no, but I bet it's a big thing, yeah. Uh, supposedly Amazon's like in, Amazon's winning the bid, right? I'm not sure yeah. if they're still, they're still winning or Amazon's a winner or not. But supposedly uh,